Hmm. Just trying to enable my camera. Hi, Travis. I'm rejoining. I'll be back in a couple minutes, just a second. So, hi everyone. How are you doing fun? Um, let, let's see if Travis is going to come back. Anyway. Let's start. We have a few topics already on the list. So. Um, the Euro just told me that um, 15.2.2 is going to be released soon, very soon, hopefully today, um, other than that maybe in, um, this week, hopefully. Um, so let's join or let's discuss our first topic, Streamline CLI. Um, yeah. Joshua. Yeah, I put that in. Um, so this is basically, so we had a couple of discussions or a, a couple of comments and a several pull requests that are basically talking about how to restructure the CLI and we all agreed to move this discussion to this meeting. And mm. I took the freedom to uh, create a small document in the form of a GitHub gist and write some things down. So the first section is about how uh, apply and daemon add could be unified. Because mm. with the pull request that you, Sebastian, that 35064, we are actually using the same code path now for daemon add and for back apply with the only difference that we do not store the spec, right? So it's some sort of a one shot. But besides yeah. that, is I would say 99% the same. So we could drop it and add a parameter to apply that is called ad hoc, no safe, non persistent, one shot, or whatever that signifies to the user that this is. This is a, a one-time operation, and that you know the, um, the spec should not actually. Be I'm I'm doing it the, the other. I'm do, I'm doing it the other way around. Um, with um, three five zero six four, I'm changing it so that daemon add will will use apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Um, but it's nothing to to one shot or not nothing non persistent or nothing relates to uh, nothing related to um, no safe. It's it's just as as um, as persistence. You got you got cut off there. What do you see? Um, 
So it's, it's going to be as persistent as, a, as apply. So where's the difference then? Um, the, the difference is that the if you want to add a new monitor, then uh, you don't have to specify all existing monitors as well. That's the only difference. Yeah. I mean, we, I think we, we already started this discussion in, in that very pull request or another one. But mm. yeah, I think we should only keep this around for, uh, you know, backwards compatibility and get rid of this mm. in the future because it's way too much overhead, at least in my opinion. Mm. But anyways... At, at the, least for Octopus, we are going to need to, to keep yeah, it alive. Yeah. Um, but anyways, the more important thing is the proposal for the redesign of the whole thing. I can give you, I will post the section, the interesting section in the chat here. And I basically try to come up with a concept that is more centered around the back thing, because that's a central building block of this, of this, of this whole orchestra thing. Because you basically control your entire cluster with backs, right? And so, you have the spec as the object, and then you have a verb, which is most most likely the operation that you're running it on. So we have spec ls, which is an alias to Ceph orchestra ls. This could be this could coexist right now. Um, and we have something like show that we already also have implemented, but we could add more details to it. And then we have something new that is called spec modify. Currently, when we want to modify something, our workflow is that we uh, export it, then change it, and then reapply it. And it's kind of tedious, right? So if you have something that shows you uh, your specification, then you should also have a way to modify your specification. Oftentimes, you only want to change one parameter. And it's less scary if you only touch one thing. And yeah. So and the next one is just a modify example for count. And what I want is a modify example for unmanaged. And then there is a spec apply, which is the same thing as our uh, currently existing apply. Just revamped a bit. And then we have the preview thing, which maybe deserves its own subcommand, maybe not, I'm not sure. But since every spec can have a preview, this is non non exclusive to OSDs, this and, and this is pretty interesting information, this maybe should deserve its own. Um yeah, and then pros and cons. The only cons that I could really find is the so the most annoying thing is the transition period that you have to take the old commands around for these for octopus and that it's a bit more verbose, which is, you know, a con because of type more, but it's also a pro because it actually reads like an English sentence, which I always found a bit, find a bit more uh, convenient always. Mm. Oh yeah, this is a draft. You can read through it, comment on it, and maybe if anybody has uh, an opinion right now, we can discuss it around. Otherwise, read it and we discuss it next week. I would like to comment in line, kind of. Yep, yeah, sure. But, but thanks for, for uh, trying to design a better API, a better CLI. Sure. The only one, one feature request is that with apply, and also that, that applies to the current apply, um, apply function, we should detect if there is a, um, uh, a, 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 a spec with, uh, with an existing service name, and we should not just overwrite, because that's kind of scary. So mm. to detect this, print a diff, and then, you know, 
reject it or whatever. Anyways, that's it. Okay. Okay. Mm. Anyone else has already a comment on on that proposal? Well, I think that is a very good idea, and maybe probably we should uh, uh, well try to to see what uh, uh, Kubernetes is doing in this moment, okay, with the apply command in order to manage CRDs, and you see the same the same approach because, for example, I think that uh, well uh, soon or later we are going to need uh, things like affinity or anti-affinity and more things. So the spec file is going to become more complex. So probably um, maybe we should uh, think about to use spec files in the same way that uh, uh, we are using uh, TRDs in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And and they are actually translated into CIDs of Kubernetes. Oh, okay. So they, they need to oh. stay compatible. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, let's. Uh, I think let's move that discussion out um, offline and um, comment in either in the um, and then just or move it to Google Docs. I don't know. Yeah, feel um, free to just comment in line, and then if we have an opinion, I will refine the document. Okay, perfect. So, developer mode in Safari. Uh, who created that topic? Yes, this is me. <laughs> it's yeah. just uh, well, I, I don't know exactly what. Uh, uh, I don't know even. Who is doing that? Okay, something uh, with uh, C patch. Okay, in order to provide a developer and friendly environment. Okay, but this is another possibility. It's just to comment if uh, this could be better. I don't know. It's just to try to to use the the local folder for the source uh, for the source of orchestrators in in the containers running the manager. I don't know if. Oh. Uh, this could be a good idea, or Ubestart is, is better than this. I don't know. That's exactly the C start. C start, okay. C start. Have a look and, at C start. Uh, no. Um, Jim again? Justin here? Yes, yes. Yes, I, okay. I have seen. But um, this is a, a command that this is available now in master? Yeah, it's uh, in, okay. in uh, star uh, source slash. Okay, okay. This I, I can look at it. it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, fantastic. That's awesome. Okay. So again, next topic. Yes, uh, it's about the uh, HA proxy implementation. I have been well, taking a look uh, to the current code that we have in the orchestrator, and mm. uh, what I have seen is that basically we are repeating exactly the same uh, approach for each the diamond, okay? And in a way that I think that uh, probably to well, to to pass to a more object-oriented uh, approach could be, uh, well, to simplify code and make things more more easy to to understand and, and to execute and to and to maintain, okay? Basically, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, we can see that very, very, uh, very easy in, in a lot of the, the functions that we have in the Ceph Orchestrator, okay? One of them is the, 
the Apply, Apply service uh, function where uh, we have this kind of, uh, of approach uh, where we are enumerating, enumerating things basically, okay? And I think that uh, it could be uh, interesting to, to go in this direction. I see yeah. that there is, okay, fantastic. Oh, okay, is everything down? <laughs> Yeah, and that's uh, in the works. Fixers, yes, not, no, this is fixed. So it's this not being created is in this. Uh... Yeah, um, I've uh, re refactored apply service a bit to make it more object oriented. Okay. It's not yet totally object oriented, but it's a step in the direction. Um, okay. And yeah, we, we really need to refactor more to make it more object oriented and have fewer um, server-specific implementations in the module.py. Basically, keeping the module.py independent of the existing of the actual service and move all the server-specific parts in into the services. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Okay. At least that's my goal. But we are not there yet. Um, if you have any refactorizations, then please do. Yes, what I well, what I have uh, thought is is just to to try to implement the the new HA proxy uh, service with uh, mm -hmm. this new approach. Okay, obviously, uh, well, it could be. Uh, I think that uh, it 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 is going going not to 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 be perfectly <laughs> uh, fit perfectly with the current code, but I think that uh, it could. Uh, orient us in the in the right direction. Okay. Um, do, do, do you want to make it so that um, the HA proxies are co-located with the RGWs, or do you want to make it an, a new kind of HA proxy service? Mm, well, I think that, uh, uh, well, mm, it's not important to be collocated with a RGW uh, service, okay? It's okay. important, I think, more important to be collocated that uh, that HA proxy staff with the manager uh, on Dynamics. Okay, 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 perfect. And uh, what is the next step? It's about, it's just that I have seen that we do not have documentation about if the device light on, okay? So uh, it's something that we are doing in the orchestrator, but probably the documentation, uh, well, the, the right place in order to put this information is in, in devices, in devices management. It's just to, well, to have some advice if this is the, the right location, and uh, I will I will do the modification, no problem with that. Yes, please do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's all for my part. Okay, um, Jan, your turn. Yeah, hey guys. Um, yeah, so uh, I started uh, work on um, drive group parsing in Ceph volume. Um, to unblock uh, Blaine and yeah, there is a well first shot at it uh, in a branch um, where I posted the link and um, yeah, since there's some some open topics here, uh, I wanted to bring those up and I mean name is the name is currently awful, but uh, I'm sure we'll find something better very soon. <laughs> Um, question is mostly, um, or I think a, a discussed topic is mostly um, post matching, which uh, Blaine would like to push down to Ceph volume, um, but I don't really see the point of that. Um, but and yeah, what else might be needed from this is kind of also an open question. I mean, we we could move host matching to the 
manager module, right? Yeah, so host matching is not really necessary, right? So if, if only the host gets the drive group that is, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I've only um, half reproduced the reasoning or not at all reproduced the reasoning behind this. So maybe, um, Blaine, can you uh, chime in here and motivate this a little? Uh, yeah, can can you hear me? Am I? Yeah. I'd yeah. actually do dial in today because the app kept like not working. <laughs> um, so the thinking that I, I think uh, Travis and I had we were first discussing this now, like a while ago, was that the 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 Ceph manager will like you know via the dashboard or via the CLI, the Ceph manager will be the one that is uh, like for the user like listing hosts, and then I'm assuming there is some sort of like the manager will have some sort of predictive kind of okay given this. Host blob. These are the hosts that it will match, uh, so that the user gets some like feedback for applying operations. So my, I, I think our our thought was that if we use that same logic, there can't be any mismatch in uh, like what hosts get information applied to them uh, from a like user interface to actual implementation perspective if like if set volume uses the same like Python code that the dashboard manager uses for that uh, kind of user feedback. So that was that was our reasoning for <coughs> wanting to have the host name matching done uh, at the set volume level. Otherwise we will probably grab a like standard glob uh, library from like Go and uh, use that in Rook. And so I, I think glob matching is <clears throat> fairly well defined, uh, but there there is some risk of like mismatch. And if that happens, then it becomes a, a bug that's kind of hard to track down. Like where where is the you know is the bug in Chef? Is it in that? That implementation of Bobbing is it in Rook? Is it like, something else? So that's my reasoning for kind of wanting to push it into set volume. Uh, it isn't strictly necessary, uh, although it, it does also mean that Rook doesn't have to like inspect the drive groups that it gets. It just has to pass them down. Uh, otherwise, it has to like inspect them and like see if they actually have a, a host name key, and like if they don't, then what? Yeah, and that's kind of the disadvantage. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to mention this is kind of the um, my motivation for pushing against this because um, in Ceph, from Ceph volume, we don't really have a good idea of uh, our host name either. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. that is a, another part. I, you know, given that grabbing the host name from Python is Difficult. I had assumed that we could pass like a host argument that would pass the like host name as as Rook does it, which is also a little bit awkward in a way. So I would okay. recommend you to do this matching uh, in the orchestrator modules so from your master machine because then you have one single source of truth and it knows the host names. And you can just resolve um, the hosts one time, send the drive groups to the matching hosts, and then just you know go. And if you do the evaluation on the host, you lose you lose a lot of functionality. For example, reporting because you don't know what will happen if you interest in that kind of information and stuff like this. So. I, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think that that logic works for the Ceph ADM, but I, that logic doesn't, I think, work quite as easily for Rook. Like the orchestrator module doesn't really do a whole lot; it just configures Rook to go and do things. 
And so it's some Python code that's changing configuration that will go and it will run a like Rook, uh, a like system that's written in Go. And and so it, it Um, what would Rook be a um, pass a list of explicit explicit host names? Um, uh, in in the drive group. Yeah. Mm, I I suppose that's an option. I don't. Uh, I didn't notice that in the drive group spec when I. I looked at it, uh, but if, if if that's an option, that that changes the ability for like blob matching to uh, get messed up. Although that does then also mean that the glob matching, like that, that has to be like updated as hosts are added to the to renovate system. Yeah. Uh, so. Mm. And, and another, I, and a third option would be to use um, labels, like you specify the a label in the drive group, and you specify labels in your Kubernetes cluster, and then let look match. The nodes in, in in the labels, right? The node labels and the drive group labels. I... Yeah, this is actually the other point that um, why I I don't think the volume is the right location for this because once you start thinking about like other matching mechanisms versus a host, uh, then you know you, it becomes really unnatural to just push this all into Ceph volume. Yeah, um, I, I I don't uh, I, I don't think that it's necessarily bad or overly risky um, to to have the logic in Rook, uh, but there 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 is a a small concern. But like I said, I, I think globbing is pretty well defined, and I I do I think for the short term want to shy away from adding extra things to either drive groups or to, uh, I mean, I guess to drive groups to try to, to make this work. Um, I'd rather stick with what sort of uh, exists now as much as possible to get something working and then add little bits. Like, like labels might be useful, but I, I don't see them as being critical. For for drive groups at least like right now. Um, so my my general plan has been to continue forward uh, and do host name matching in Rook, and just make sure that we're using standardized cloud matching and try to understand like. Yeah, I, I think I'll just look into like uh, patching a little more and, and probably chat with like maybe Sebastian about whether the like manager is has a cloud matching library that it, it uses. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, and anything, um, any other features that should go into this particular subcommand here? Anything else that the above layers would need from Ceph volume here? Um, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I I did layer on some changes. I just have a uh, mostly to to have be able to pass a JSON blob to a. a flag. Yep. Yeah. I'll make sure to pull that in for sure. Uh, and then. There, there is the the naming. It seems like Steph Volume Drive Group is a, a a good name to me. Deploy was a little a little strange, so I think yeah, that's I, my, my yeah. I just didn't want to get 
you know, bogged down in uh, bike shedding when I started this. Um, okay, cool. I think that's the um, most of what I wanted to know. Um, I will uh, push this. Yeah. What about pilot policy? Um, so I know that you have been working on this for a while. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, sorry, I have to get the window open. Um, item potency of the LVM bash command. Oh, yes, actually, while I'm here, um, I have this up in a PR. Um, this PR needs um, uh, care. I'm currently writing tests for it. Um, sorry, I'm filling right now. Here we are. Um, yeah, um, please, uh, if you, if anybody would be able to test that, that would be um, very helpful. Um, there's the link to the rewrite. Um, yeah, so this basically enables you to, um, like, call the same batch command on on a node over and over again, and it will only redeploy the or it will only deploy the the parts that are not already deployed of course um yeah as i said this needs uh, more tests and more testing too um but i think um this should be going fairly quickly um mostly because i swapped out like somewhat almost 2000 lines of code for like 500 or so so I hope this is a little uh, more straightforward to grasp. Um, yeah, otherwise, if there's anything up with that, let me know. If it works for you, let me know. Um, I'm hoping to add like the most basic testing this week. And uh, we have a, um, a customer downstream too who would like to try this out. So hopefully you get some some exposure for testing here, and then I'm I'm happy to merge this uh, into master as well as into um, the several branches. Well, that's great. Yeah, pretty great. But here we're we're back to um, how to test things locally inside containers, right? Right, right. Um, that's why I kind of listened up earlier. Um, so for I have another PR that I want to test with Ceph ADM, and well, I ended up uh, pushing a Shaman build for that, um, which you know is workable but uh, not ideal from just from the delay perspective and turnaround times and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be really handy if we had a way of just injecting some dev code into a, a running container, ideally. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody has spent much thought on that yet, but uh, it would be nice if we could uh, figure out something like that. Absolutely agree. Too so bad that Josh isn't here today. Yes. Bad. Hmm. Yeah, I'll take a look at C-Star 2. Um, mostly, I'm, well, I don't want to derail this here, but I'm, I'm mostly wondering what technology or what kind of concept is used for that. Because there are, of course, variable things that one can do. Um, um, but yeah. C-Star, create a new container image based on your current dev build in your current work tree. And then create a new cluster based on that newly created image. Uh -huh. Okay, I mean that will be certainly helpful, but I think it would also be nice to have something uh, to inject into a running cluster. And that's not just from the Ceph volume perspective. That's also thinking about um, uh, yeah downstream needs in the future when you know everybody has customers on this and we're trying to uh, debug some some issue that only one customer sees, then it would certainly be helpful if we could uh, kind of inject uh, modified code into containers without, you know, tearing down a container and bringing it up again. Mm. 
Uh, I mean, you, you still need to restart the daemon, at which point you're going to lose any code changes in your container. That's the main problem that I see right now. Um, yeah, to, and that, to keep that is, kind of. yeah, and that's probably an issue, at least to how things sometimes get debugged right now. But even in even without restarting the daemon, there's I see a use case for this where, you know, um, I don't know, in in uh, with problematic OSDs, we've definitely had situations where we uh, just patched like um, the um, the uh, blue store table tool, I think it's called or something like that, like the tool with which you can uh, inspect a, a local OSD store. And that's independent of the actual OSD, but you probably want, want to do it with, you know, within a problematic, uh, within a buggy uh, Ceph OSD container, essentially. Mm. The only thing that I know could work as to run CFADM enter and then manually replace binaries. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's kind of what I'm suspecting will happen anyway. Um, for for Ceph volume, you know, this is as easy as just copying some Python code with um, compiled code that might be a bit more tricky. Um, anyway, I, I mostly, I'm oh, glad that this is on the agenda that people talk about this because I I think um, this hasn't gotten that much attention yet. Uh, I know that uh, Tim is at least looking at um, kind of uh, debugging tools for for the container world. Uh, for now, it's mostly gathering gathering info, but at some point we probably want to um, change uh, running things too, which yeah, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to be possible quite straightforward yet. Um, how is it done on the rook side? Do, do you actually modify running containers? Uh, I generally do not modify running containers. Um, I will push modified containers up and then either restart the operator to like make the Ceph containers all use the same one, the same like updated one, or uh, redeploy Ark entirely, um, which is not, I mean, it's not necess necessary um, always to, to do that. Like it is, <coughs> Like theoretically possible to you know inject uh, updated files into a running container, and then if it is a binary, just restart that binary. Uh, although at that point you may as well restart the container as well, I would think. Uh, or yeah, I mean it's it's different for things that are running to be restarted versus you know like even I think a Python process like replacing Python files, you'd still want to restart whatever container you put those modified files into uh, just to make sure that the Python interpreter wasn't still running with the old files. Uh, but if it's like configuration files or, or something like that, or like for web servers, it's very easy just to like push new HTML information and then like reload, like have the web server reload that information. Uh, so I in in my opinion, it's it makes most sense to update a built container and then just restart whatever single container you want updated if you're trying to like really optimize for the least amount of like environment churn. Okay, and um, for Ceph ADM, um, we don't really have a local workflow for that kind of thing yet, do we? Um, we, we have um, vstart minus minus Ceph ADM, which 
ma mainly only works for uh, for changing Ceph ADM itself and uh, and developing the Ceph ADM manager module because the manager is then out outside of the container um, outside of the containers and then it's just restarting the manager and keeping all existing demons running in the container. So um, that's the workflow for Ceph ADM itself. Uh, and uh, and say if I that, have like a, a a running cluster like you know on on a workstation and I wanna um, basically do what uh, what Travis just described like create a new container from my dev code and then uh, deploy a single container uh, with that code. Um, Ceph ADM knows how to deploy a specific or to upgrade or uh, to, to modify or to redeploy a container with a specific image. So you use um, dev config and then um, using the key uh, container underscore image um, with the correct daemon ID and then you're um, calling a ceph -orch redeploy daemon and then it's going to get redeployed with the correct container image. But, but that image so is still coming from the registry or? That's still coming from any registry, either a local one or yeah, uh, from, from any container registry. Okay, that, so local, why... local registry is the trick to this. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. I think it's also the workflow usually done for Kubernetes to, to set up a local registry. So what is the build time of a, of a container and uploading it to your local registry? If that's pretty fast, so it wouldn't at least be terrible. Because there is a, there is a third scenario. For example, I encountered this when um, trying to debug OSD deployment. So you can't modify the OSD code because there would be a new container uh, a new container is being spawned, and so that the code that you wanted to change must already exist in the container image that you were spawning. So, yeah. so at least for that scenario, you have to have some kind of local registry that you mm -hmm. push a new container to that you have just built. I think for Kubernetes, you're also using a local registry, right? Plain, Travis. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, I mean, my typical workflow is, you know, make whatever code changes I need, build the image, push it into my test environment, which is usually Minikube, and then and then restart the operator to pick up the changes. And do you have a like ballpark on turnaround time for this? Oh, it's you know, say. 30 seconds to a minute to build it and then 30 seconds or a minute to push it into the local registry. It's all on my local laptop. So it's no, you know, there's no network latency um, involved. Okay, cool. Um, I don't think you, uh, I don't suppose you have any uh, docs or documents maybe on this, what that describes this kind of? Um, there's, I'm trying to think. I'm not sure it's not well documented. We have a script for starting Minikube that has a helper in it to kind of push an image into the Minikube registry, if that helps. But let me see if I can find a link real quick, if we do have something. Cool, that would be awesome, thanks. Mm, I've, I'm also going to add a new link to the other pad to the, week, to the minutes. It's um, called KubeJacker. Which, which lets you, which lets you build, build um, container images for developing the manager Python code base in in a Kubernetes environment. And that's uh, similar to C start in a way.
Yeah, I can't find documentation, but let me just point it to the helper script if that helps to push the image into the registry. So, I mean, at least for a CFADM development, it wouldn't be as bad, right? So, if we can somehow reduce the, the time that it takes to rebuild a image or a container, container image, then, yeah. it, you know, picking up the new uh, container image is a matter of seconds and, you know, turnaround time of minute max, I would say, kind of fine. And that's exactly what Josh is just uh, Josh is going to do. He's going to, um, and instead of rebuilding the image, uh, we're just linking or mounting the Python source code into the running container, which means that you're going to have instant um, updates of your code base when restarting containers. Nice, yeah, that's kind of what I thought would be nice to have. And just poke Josh. I think he's he hadn't really time to actually work on it, but at least that's his plan. Cool. All right, I think I just, link, I just put a link to that script we have for pushing an image in, in the minutes, if that helps. Yeah. Cool, thanks a lot. All right, um, yeah, I was just going to say I'm out of things I wanted to bring up. Okay, anything else for today? Then um, enjoy, and um, let's meet up next week again. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.